hear that. All right, open your Bible. We're going again. Guess what book? You would not guess. Proverbs, well done. Proverbs, we're all the way to chapter 2. So we're going to look at chapter 2 today, and we're going to go through the entire chapter. I know you are up for it. So hopefully you are indeed bringing your Bible here, and you're writing in it, and you're allowing it to write in your heart as well. As we look to God's Word to gain God's wisdom as He details to us what the good life entails, or how we can live a life that is good. And so I want you to be encouraged, I want you to gain hope, I want you to be able to see a clear pathway forward, regardless of your age, regardless of your circumstance, that we would listen to God. Because God is always speaking. That's not the question. The question is, are we listening? So our prayer today, my prayer today, is that God would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Okay, so here we are, Proverbs chapter 2, and we're going to go through this whole chapter. Now, you'll see in this chapter, wisdom is personified as good, godly, wise parents giving advice to their children. And we'll see in this chapter that there's a formula here, and it's a if-then formula. And we're um, familiar with this. It's contractual. For instance, if you take a job somewhere, perhaps like Chick-fil-A, they'll say, if you work from 9 to 5, then we will pay you $14 an hour or whatever it is. Okay? If you do this, then you'll do that. It's a conditional promise. And there are promises in Scripture that are not conditional, okay? They're just based upon God's character. So you'll see promises all over Scripture that's non-conditional. Also in Scripture, you'll see promises that are conditional. If you seek me, I, you will, I will be found by you, right? And so things like this. So this morning in this passage, we'll see some conditional promises. If you do this, then these benefits will come to you. So it calls out to us and gives us a choice. And we have choices every day to make. And God meets us in those crossroads, in those times in which we need to choose this way or that way. And wisdom calls to us. And so let's hear from wisdom today and pursue what God would have to say. So there is a number of things we're going to look at from this passage. And this is the first condition. It is desire wisdom. So if you want God's wisdom, you have to have a desire for it. And that seems pretty basic, but not everyone wants the wisdom of God. So right in the beginning of this chapter... It gives us the conditions. These are the if statements. And we'll see three if statements right here. And we'll focus in on our part of the contract, so to speak. And then we'll go through and see what God will do if we do what he asks us to do. So here we are. This is Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. My son, my daughter, my child, listen to me. If, there's the first if... If you accept my words and store up my commandments within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, And if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. We're going to pause right there. Now, did you see the conditions? If, if, if. This puts responsibility upon us. Again, God has responsibility, and he also gives us responsibility as well. And the invitation is to take God up on his promise, the if-then promise. 
And so he tells us a few things. My son, my daughter, if, this is the first thing in verse 1, if you accept my words. Isn't it crazy to think not, not everybody wants God's wisdom? That's crazy to me, right? The truth is that there are a lot of people, and perhaps even some in this room are listening to us online, that think that they know better than God, right? They think that they know what is wise. They think that they know what is best. And they don't really want to hear the advice of their godly father. Sometimes, like teenagers, right? And have you ever had a teenager in your house? We love them, don't we? We pray for them, and sometimes we pray for them by laying on of hands. Not everybody wants to hear. Right? And you're probably saying, well, I want to hear, because you are here, true. But I want to ask you, do you really? Right? Do you want to hear God say something to you that you don't want God to say to you? Right? Are we listening? We love to listen when God talks to us about the blessings. We say, come on, thank you, Jesus. Right? But then sometimes... God approaches us like Hebrews chapter 12. God disciplines those he loves. You know that? God loves us. And God's expression of love comes in various forms. And it surely comes to us in wisdom. My son, my daughter, listen to me. Follow me. Do what I say. It will go well with you. God knows the right way, by the way. And he doesn't just keep this information to himself and like, well, I hope they figure it out down there. Right. He is a good father that calls to us as a good parent saying, listen to me. Accept my words and then store up my commands within you. Now remember, this is Solomon who is writing these things to us by the Spirit of the Lord. This is Solomon who built this amazing temple. And he understood the sacred place of the word of the Lord in the inner part of the sanctuary. This same image is given to us here. It's not just accepting them, but treasuring them, putting them in the heart of hearts. It's not just hearing God's word, but it's treasuring it as life. Is that something that we do? And this, again, is a condition that says, if you accept my words, if you store up my commands within you, What's the treasure of your heart? What is it that you hold on to as sacred, as of the highest value? Is it God's word or is it something other? So God gives us a condition and says, listen, I'm calling to you. Now accept what I'm saying. Open the gate of your heart. And then when it comes in, treasure it. Value it. Esteem what I have to say to you. Turn your ears to wisdom. And applying your heart to understanding. Listening is just not gathering information. It's living it. Applying it. The way that I and this world and your parents and your spouse and your children and your grandchildren and your employees and your employer and your community people, the only way that they're going to know that you treasure God's word in your heart is if you live it through your life. Right? Application. Information is just 
stagnation without application. I just made that up, okay? But it's true. <laughs> Information is stagnation without application. I'm not asking you how much you know, but I'm asking you how much you live. This is a condition. If you accept my words, if you treasure them in your heart, if you apply your heart to understanding conditions. And so this is a, um, uh, an active reception to God's word. I want to hear. And then he kicks it up to another degree. Instead of just a receiving it, it's the pursuit of wisdom. Remember, verse 3, right? So we have wisdom. Last week we talked about wisdom calling out to us in chapter 1. And will you receive it? Will you treasure it? Will you apply it? And then check out what happens in verse 3. Indeed, if you call out for insight, if you cry aloud for understanding, if you look for it as silver, and if you search for it as gold. This is more than just a um, passive receptivity. This is an uh, active intentionality, okay? It's not just waiting for wisdom to come to you, but you crying out for it, right? There is a difference there. Are you not just, um, uh, not just being passively receiving, but you are actively pursuing God's Wisdom. He calls to us, but are you in a place in which you call to God? Sometimes God allows difficulties in our lives to see who we will shout out to, right? To see in whom or to what we will turn to. Who and what will you pursue? When our, our kids were in our house, right? We pursued them for wisdom. But at a time, they graduated at a time, we all go on from this house to create our own house. And we have to shift from being um, passively receiving to actively pursuing wisdom. Are you doing that? Or are you settling just to be entertained? Or what are you indeed pursuing if you call out for insight. God, speak to me if you cry out for understanding. God, help me to understand what is happening. If you look for it as refined silver, silver that is hidden in the ground like a precious diamond or of gold that requires some digging, it requires some effort, it requires some energy, it requires some investment. Search for it as hidden treasures. I've told my kids this, that the best $10 that you can spend is buying a book. You guys remember those? They're amazing. You can get about any book that you want for a $10 download. Right? Why do we spend $10 on a burger that goes in and goes out? And we don't spend $10 to get a piece of somebody's brain. That's the best money you can spend. I'll tell you, you go down to the Rockford Rescue Mission, and if you go try to donate books, know where they put most of those books? In big bins. They don't even look at them. They just dump them into them. I'm just telling you the truth. You know why? Because no one buys them. You know why? Because we don't read a whole lot anymore. You know why? easier to be entertained. What was that? Got our nose in the computer. Nose in the computer. Yeah. Now, if you're reading books on the computer, that's okay. Right? Yeah. I do. I read them. What are you pursuing? It requires energy, investment. There are godly and wise people in this room, and there's godly and wise people that God brings around us, are you calling them up and saying, hey, can we talk? Hey, can we pray? Hey, can you help me? That's a gift. God gives us the ability to understand and to learn and to listen. And he gives us his word. 
It's not if you have God's word, but does God's word have you? And are you seeking it? Are you seeing this invitation? It requires something of us. And my ask, the Holy Spirit's asking us, will you do this? Will you open your heart? Will you open your mind? Will you open your spirit? Will you pursue me as if silver search for me as in treasure? Will you call out to me? This is the first part of the equation. Now then, God gives us the reward for our pursuit, the then to the if. Now again, we focus in on the if, and then we anticipate by promise what he'll give to us. Aren't you glad that God is faithful to his promises? God will always fulfill his part of the equation. God will always fulfill his promise. His track record is 100%. God gets an A plus plus a scratch and sniff sticker on his assignments. 100%. Always. Will we take him up? So let's listen then to what happens. If we're pursuing this, guess what we'll first find, and this might surprise you. Find the knowledge of God. This is super interesting as you go through this passage. So let's go through it together, starting with verse 5 or continuing with verse 5. If you do these things, then, here we go, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. And you'll find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. He is a shield to those whose walk blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Don't you like that? And I want you to see what God does for those who pursue him. Now again, you see these qualifiers like Mm, the upright, those whose walk is blameless, those who are just, those who are faithful. And I don't know about you, but I have failed. I have failed. Right? Here's the good news. The one who gives us his promises also helps us to be what he requires of us. Right? He makes us just. He provides us righteousness. He is the one who renews us, and we just have to say yes to him and follow him. He helps us in these things. And don't you like, if you are pursuing wisdom, the first thing that you will find is the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of the holy. How does that work? People who are really looking to understand, for instance, how anything works and where the foundation of the world is or how relationships work. If we are truly pursuing wisdom, we'll ultimately come to the source of all wisdom, who is God himself. Our pursuit of wisdom leads us like a stream. If they're going upstream and going to the source. And God says that he is the one who gives wisdom. He is the one who holds success. He is the one who gives us knowledge and understanding. He is the one who shields us and guards us and protects us. He does this. And he does that in response to those who receive his word, treasure his word, looks for it. And then he says, I'll guard you now. 
I will protect you by my wisdom. You know that there are things in this world that are out to get you. Not everyone is for you. Not everyone wants you to live the good life. The world has snares, and it has snakes, and it has pitfalls, and it has problems, and it has sticky places, and it has things with hooks and briars that want to pull us and take us and destroy us. Things that promise us the good life but end of dragging us to death. God calls to us, finds me, understands who I am. I will protect you. The then part of the equation. Understand, pursue, find the knowledge of God. Ask for it. God, show me your wisdom. You grow closer to him as you walk according to his path. Next point. Understand what is right and just and fair. Do you always understand what to do? Do you always know? I don't. Some things I know pretty clear. Other things, it takes a process of discernment. What is right to do? What is the just thing to do? What is indeed fair? And the people who pursue God ask these questions. Other people who are not pursuing him, they are not asking what is right and just and fair. They are asking about what they can get out of it. They're asking often what's easy, right? What can I get away with? And what will delight me right now, regardless of the long-term circumstances? Those who seek wisdom find the Lord, and from the Lord he protects us and gives us his wisdom, and his wisdom is without limit. He tells us what is right. He shows us what is just. He tells us what is there, verse 9. Another then, then you will understand what is right and just and fair. Every good path, that is, every way that is good to go, every choice that will lead you in a good Godward direction. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you. And understanding will guard you. So once you know about God and know him, then you will understand what is right, what is just, what is fair, every good path. You'll know what to do when it comes to how you are to live your life. Godly character is applied theology. Good theology. Biblical theology. That's godly character. When we apply it, how we live flows from what we believe. What we believe comes from our desire and our pursuit of wisdom. Wisdom, when it enters our heart, when it moves from something we know to something we believe will be pleasant to your soul. There is a massive difference between knowing something and believing something. It's what is called the 18-inch drop, right? I know a lot of things here, right? I know a lot, but I don't believe it all, right? When I decide to believe, okay, metaphorically, it shifts from my mind to my heart, right? About 18 inches, right? And so God says, hey, will you pursue me, and will you know some things, and then choose to believe them, apply it in your heart, put it into action, and then the pathway will be shown to you. You know the song, Thy word will be a light to my feet and a lamp to my path? 
Psalm 119, right? There's a good song, Amy Grant sang that song, remember? Thy word is a light into my path, whatever it is. Dave, don't sing. Okay, okay. <laughs> I can kind of thing. God's word sometimes just gives us the next step to take, and sometimes that's all you need to know. And then he'll show us the next step. And then often, not only will he show you what's the next step, but he'll show you the way to go. A lamp to my path, a light to my feet. So God, will you shine light in the next step I need to take along your good pathway? And if you're seeking him, he'll show you that. Just take the step. And then you can look that you know what, God is showing me, I don't know necessarily what's around every corner, but I know he's leading me, and that's good enough. Right? Move. God won't promise to show you everything that's going to happen. Right? If you knew everything that was going to happen, you probably wouldn't take the next step. <laughs> but do you know who's calling you? Do you trust him enough Take a step in his direction. So if you're waiting that you want to have all of the details figured out for you to take a step in God's word direction, I'm going to tell you, stop waiting and step in the knowledge that you know now. You'll never know all of it. But you'll know enough of it to know what to do. Some of you need to hear that today. Or someone needs to hear that today. Understand what is right and just and fair. We need more people. We need Christians to understand what is right to do, what is just to do, and what is fair. We will gain that knowledge if we um, pursue it. These are promises. We'll see... Two more promises and then a conclusion. So God says, if you pursue me, then these things will happen. If you pursue me, then then you will find the knowledge of God. And from this knowledge, we'll be protected, we'll be provided, we'll be uh, illuminated where where to go. We'll understand what is right and we'll understand what is just. We'll understand what is fair. And then he says, we will be saved from a couple things. The first is this, be saved from wicked people. Proverbs chapter 2, starting with verse 17. Okay? This is another then statement. Wisdom will save you from the ways of the wicked man, the wicked woman, from men whose words are perverse, twisted, who have left the straight paths to walk in dark ways who delight in doing wrong and rejoice in the perverseness of evil, whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. God's wisdom will help us to discern the end from the beginning. What is actually taking place. Now the wisest people on this planet are those who think long term. They think about how their choices today will affect their life tomorrow. Their life a decade from now. A life decades from now. How long, by the way, if you have a two year old, how long is their time orientation? What, about five seconds? <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Right? They can only think in terms of five minutes. Right? Or when's my next meal? Right? They're only thinking in short increments of time. Right? Not wise, they want what I want right now. Teenagers can do that, adults can do that. And if we're addicted to something, it's typically I only can think about my next 
hit, my next drink, the next time I can do what? That's all you're thinking about. And we become a little wiser, we think longer term, instead of having our money burn in our pocket that we have to spend it because we want the reward right now, we think about how can I invest, we think about, you know what, if I study hard today, thank you graduates, therefore that will allow me to have other opportunities later on, which will allow me to have greater opportunities later on, and we think that way. But people are unwise, they don't think about today. I don't want to do my homework today because I'm tired, so therefore I'll play video games, and therefore we have problems later on because we are not giving ourselves to the hard work. How long term do you think? Where is this choice leading? Wisdom says, hey, think about this. If you make this small compromise, typically it'll lead to another compromise a little bigger. And then that typically leads to another compromise. <laughs> and we don't think about that. It's problematic. We as Christians not only are to think about our golden years, but I want you to think about your eternal years. You don't think long term enough. Well, I'm thinking about the end of my life too short. Think about what you do now, how it affects 100,000 years from now. Think about the choice that you make now. How will this impact eternity, and does this matter then? Think that way. Come on. Right? People who think that way, they go to the mission field. People who think that way tithe joyfully and give voluntarily. Recognizing that we cannot take it with us, but the only things that will matter in the end is Christ and his kingdom. And we have opportunity to invest in eternity. Why would we not take that opportunity? The wisest people... Give now so they can live then. Come on. I want you to think about your life in these terms. How will this choice, or will this choice impact eternity? Where will be the greatest long-term reward? And choose that thing. So keep us from wickedness, the perverseness of Evil, the progressiveness of evil. Evil is never static. It always denigrates. It always gets worse. Always. Wisdom will save you from wicked men, wicked women who are trying to entice you, to call you, to ensnare you. Ask God what is happening? Ask God where is this leading? Ask God what is right. Second, another group of people. Wisdom will save us from immoral people. Wisdom will do this. Be saved from immoral people. And we'll see this in chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. This immoral calling. Come, be with me. Verse 16, wisdom will save you also from the adulterous woman, the adulterous man. From the wayward woman with her seductive words. Who has left the partner of her youth and ignored the covenant she made before God. Surely, her house leads down to death, and her past to the spirit of the dead. None who go to her return or obtain the paths of life. So we need to talk about this. Does adultery happen in our culture? You guys are familiar with this. 
Does it happen sometimes in the church? Never, never, never happens there. It happens. It happens. One of my great privileges as a pastor is to do weddings. Just did one yesterday. It was very warm, <laughs> but very powerful. We've done a lot, a lot, a lot of premarital counseling with couples and postmarital counseling. And I tell these couples before they get married, the most important thing about your wedding is not the flowers. It's not the dress. It's not the cake. It's not the venue. It's not those who are there. It's not how good you look. It's not the music. The most important things of everything that happens is what you vow to each other. That's why we gather this covenant that you make. I tell them, if you're going to focus on anything, spend a lot of time on your vows. And you write them out, you be intentional, and I want you to see that you're saying them with pap- uh, papage? I don't even know what that is. With purpose? <laughs> With papage, marriage. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Princess Bride, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Some of you are like, I know what you're talking about. With purpose and intensity. The wedding yesterday, they were focused. No one was there, and we were applauding. Come on, say it, mean it. Say it, mean it. It is, what's the word? Moral murder. It's probably the strongest I can say it. When people forsake their vows that they make when they're young. And does anyone stand up there in their wedding day saying, I really don't mean this to you? No. No. How do they get to this point of straying away? One step at a time, friends. Just one step at a time. One more look. One more connection. One more pulling away. Step a step a step away. And we get snared. We get pulled in. We get bamboozled. There's a good word. (laughs) Seduced. And the promise that leads up to some heavenly experience, but ultimately it heads down to death. We think this is the pathway to some type of bliss. In actuality, it's the gates to hell. Now granted, can God rescue us from our own foolishness? We say amen to that. There are people who have repented from unwise behavior, being seduced, and then there's lots of, lots of issues there. I, I understand that, and some of you have gone through this. I understand the sensitivities. Looking back on it, oh Lord, was I unwise? Was I blinded by what I thought was better versus clinging to the partner of my youth. God, when we repent and return, can redeem, and we can say hallelujah, but will save us for so much heartache and heartbreak, betrayal. Wisdom will save us from a moral people. When we think about, I made these vows, and if I go over there, this is where it's going to end up. Don't take the bait. Lastly, and he sums it up this way, okay? We'll come into a landing with these verses, and then we're going to transition to communion. Live in the land. When I talk about living in the land, this is truly living, not just existing, not just being here, taking up space and air and nourishment for a moment, but truly and eternally living. This is the final promise for those who pursue wisdom, who pursue God. Thus you will walk in the ways of the good and keep to the paths of the righteous. 
For the upright will live, live in the land. And this is not just a view for our life here. This is a view for the land that is eternal. Someone say amen, right? Living, not being thrust away from God's good creation and heaven and a new earth will permanently have a peace, a, uh, an inheritance in the land. Think about Israel, and they say their, their inheritance was having a peace in the land that was permanent forever. That was not just about them and their descendants, but it was a foreshadow of eternity. That you'll have a peace of heaven forever, never to be evicted, never to lose it, but it is yours eternally. Live in the land. The upright will live in the land. The blameless, because God makes us blameless, will remain in it, but the wicked will be cut off from the land. And the unfaithful will be torn. So wisdom calls out to us today. You have so much to gain by the if part, the then part of the equation. We have so much to gain. Protection from God. Guarding us from the wicked man, from the wicked woman. We have Success that is available for us, how God defines it. We have a problem of, uh, excuse me, a promise of provision <laughs> and illumination and understanding. So much to gain if we accept, if we treasure, if we pursue God and His wisdom. Will you be people who do this today? That's the question. That's the call. If you will, then you will live in the land. You will be among the land of the living. You will truly live in it. Aren't you grateful that wisdom calls to us and then wisdom was embodied for us and the person of Jesus Christ? Amen? lived in the wisdom of God. We know about it, we read about, read about it, we can see it in Jesus' life. Jesus, Scripture tells us, is the wisdom of God who always did the will of his Father. It was not always easy, but it was always right. And it will be rewarded. Jesus' name, like we started out, was lifted to the highest place because he took the lowest place, became a servant even to death. Right? It's descending into greatness. If you want to be, have God lift you up, you don't lift yourself up, you go down to pursue him, to serve others. Jesus, the wisdom of God, who makes us righteous and who invites us to follow him, pursue him, and he calls to us even this day. The wisest person receives Christ, <laughs> recognizing we need his blood, we need his righteousness, we need his life. And we pursue the one who pursues us. And so we're going to celebrate being in Christ right now. Dan, as you come up and lead us.